So before we um, get into the Dharma talk, um, we'll set our motivation, in particular looking at this is what's to be expected in terms of difficulty and hardship, because this is samsara. And so it's not a surprise or a shock. And what's more, it can be very useful for transforming the mind and seeing where we're at. And the reason why we're looking at karma is one, just because it's interesting. It's an interesting premise. It's an interesting worldview. And it's something that people know that Buddhists believe in, but they don't actually understand what it means. There's a lot of misconceptions about karma. And yet it's intriguing. I think for you know Buddhist, non-Buddhist, believer, non-believer, I think the concept of karma is very intriguing to a lot of society. There's something very interesting about looking at why do we have what our experiences and how do we respond to our experiences right these are the things that you're looking at all the time why do people experience what they experience and how do they respond to that so from a buddhist perspective that's really the essence of the teachings on karma is to look at why is this happening to me good or bad and then when it's happening to me how do i respond am i creating more of the same do I want to create more of the same? These are the big questions to ask ourselves. In what I'm experiencing right now, it's coming from the past, whether we think it's coming from the past related to karma, or we think it's coming from the past related to context and history and conditioning and genetics. We know that our current experience is related to the past. This is something that I think we all agree on. And then as we are having our present moment experience, how we respond to it very much dictates our future. So if we respond in the same way, we're gonna have the same results. This is obvious, this is logical. You don't have to believe anything in particular. You just need to observe your life and its patterns. Um, you might say to yourself every New Year's, I'm gonna cut out sugar and then, you know, you haven't done any work to replace or to adjust or to do this or to that. And then you do cut out sugar for a solid three or four days and then back to your old habits. It takes something really significant within you to make even a small change. It has to be worth your while. You have to think of the long-term effect of something in order to make a real-time immediate decision. You know, a lot of our immediate decisions are okay with us because they're not gonna do any harm today. Yeah, we're very, you know, kind of short-sighted and limited in our choices and our decision-making. So of course, if you don't recycle anything today, you're not destroying the planet today. But there's been many, many todays, which means that we have a planet full of plastic, et cetera, et cetera, right? So in looking at karma, we can kind of, um, shock ourselves into awareness that all of our life is our own creation. Nothing is happening to us. Things are happening from us. And this is very empowering because it takes the power back from circumstances. So there's a secular way to look at karma and there's a very Buddhist way to look at karma. And you know, you just pick the bits that seem useful and resonate with you. Look at it less from the perspective of a scholar and more from the perspective of how do I apply that understanding to my daily life? Yeah, how would I live differently if I believed this? How would I respond to other people's joys and other people's suffering if I believed this? How would my responses change if I really believed this content? So first we're gonna start by dispelling misconceptions about karma. Um, this is self-evident to a lot of you, but a lot of the questions that people ask in class 
um, not Dharma students in general, but you guys specifically and Dharma students in general, seem to reflect that there's still not a total clarity about what karma isn't, let alone what karma is. Okay, so we're just gonna like cut the doubts. Okay, karma is not fate. So fate is the development of events beyond a person's control, regarded as determined by a supernatural power. So that's the part that particularly is objected to in Buddhism, determined by a supernatural power, okay? That there's someone dictating what's happening to you. Fate is also related to the course of someone's life or the plan for someone's life or the outcome of a particular situation for someone or something as seen beyond, beyond their control. So a lot of us say and hear the words, everything happens for a reason. Yeah, I hear a lot of people say, everything happens for a reason. And behind that is often an idea that there's been a course laid out for you. Yeah, that sometime, somehow you're magically moving towards um, all of the things you need to finish the journey of this life as if it had all been orchestrated by some divine power saying, now you will meet your partner, now you will have this child, now you will go into this career, here are your points of transition, and it's been gifted to you or um, bestowed upon you by some higher power. This is not at all what karma is. Karma is not fate. Um, there is always choice related to karma even though there is an aspect of things being beyond our control, they're not completely beyond our control. Okay, so karma is not fate. Karma is not destiny. So the events that will necessarily happen to a particular person or thing in the future, the idea that she was unable to control her own destiny. So, you know, there are a lot of illusions out there, like you'll figure it out magically before you die. Yeah, that you're destined to do this or to do that. The reality is you're habituated to do this or to do that. And it might be a good habituation or it might be a negative habituation, but it's not destiny. So it could be from the time you were a child, you were a very good listener and you were a very good friend and that naturally developed into who you are today as an analyst. And it feels like this is my destiny. I've finally found my calling. This is perfect for me, which in a way is true and in a way is not. What's happened is that you've ridden the wave of habits and conditions and now you've made choices based on where your energy was flowing anyway. You could have chosen to make a dramatic change in course and maybe some of you have. Maybe some of you were terrible listeners and terrible friends when you were little kids and then uh, something shocked you into awakening your compassion and you changed course and now you became these beautiful compassionate analysts that you are today. So um, karma is not destiny, very important. Karma is not predestination. Yeah, predestination, the doctrine that all events have been willed by God. It's usually with a reference to the, the eventual fate of an individual soul. So explanations of predestination often seek to address the paradox of free will, whereby God's omniscience seems incompatible with human free will. Sometimes it's related to prophecy. And in Buddhism, there are prophecies, but they're not a fait accompli. Right, so it might, so for example, there's a very famous prophecy in Buddhism that Guru Padmasambhava, Guru Rinpoche gave, which was uh, something like when the iron bird flies and our people are scattered throughout the globe, the Buddha Dharma will come to the land of the red faced people. And Padmasambhava gave that prediction centuries and centuries ago. And of course, we take that to mean when the iron bird flies, that must mean an airplane and our people are scattered to the 10 directions. All the Tibetans had to leave, you know, or not all the Tibetans, but many of the Tibetans were exiled from Tibet or refugees from the Chinese occupation. They're spread all over the world. And the Buddha Dharma will come to the land of the red faced people. That would be Westerners or Caucasian people, um, etc. cetera. Um, that's a prophecy that we think came true it's not the same thing as it being fate or destiny. It was that Guru Padmasambhava 
had enough clairvoyance to see the way things were trending. So more than a prophecy, it was like a prediction. The way in which a weatherman can make a quite accurate prediction about what the weather is going to be for the next week. And so based on the education of the weatherman and based on the knowledge available and accessible determines how far ahead they can make a prediction about the weather. The same is true of clairvoyance or people that can have far seeing or this ability to see the future or see the minds of others. It's very much like a well-educated weatherman who can read the signs and see where things are going. And so you might say there's an 80% chance of rain, it's probably going to rain. Similarly, Padmasambhava said, you know, basically there's a what 90% chance that this is going to happen, but he didn't frame it in that way. He had enough clairvoyance to know a few centuries ahead. If you're a Buddha, you can see all the spectrum of infinite possibilities, but it's not like things are predetermined and finished. Okay? So when we talk about karma, it can start to sound like ideas from other religions and ideas from other cultures. And there's elements that are similar and then there are elements that are dramatically different. So we just wanna make sure we're not mixing them in a way that's not skillful. Karma is not punishment, okay? You know this, but sometimes uh, when we talk about it, it sounds like you still think that it is. Or um, when you don't like someone that you think, oh, well, they'll get their karma as if they'll get their punishment. Right? the infliction or imposition of a penalty as retribution for an offense. Um, so when we're thinking about karma, if you think it's punishment, that means there's a punisher. That means there's someone who's decided that you must be harmed because you are bad. And Buddhism is not that simplistic. And there is no one orchestrating the suffering that you experience besides yourself. So it's not retribution either. Um, punishment inflicted on someone as like vengeance for a wrong or a criminal act, okay? It's not retribution. It's also not reward, okay? So when things that are good happen to us, of course we created the cause, right? The fact that we have resources, the fact that we have, I don't know, safety and that we have a loving family or whatever our good things are, they're not a thing given in recognition of one's service, effort, or achievement, okay? It's not bestowed upon you. You created the cause for it. So um, just sitting with that, all right? Punishment, reward is not karma, okay? And so I know it seems redundant and uh, maybe unnecessary, but we need to really hammer this home in our mind that karma is not fate, it's not destiny, it's not predestination, it's not punishment or retribution, it's not reward, there is no judge and jury, karma is not personified, though it is personal. So to say karma is not personified means there is no person, there is no sentience behind karma other than your own sentience that created it. So what karma is? Karma is action, meaning mental intention. It's also related to verbal and physical activities. Karma is also the consequences of action, the result or effect of an action or condition. So when you think the word consequence, don't assume negative. A consequence is just a result or an effect, okay? To say it's the consequence often sounds like it's negative, but that's not actually the meaning of the word in English. For example, the negative is many have been laid off from work as a consequence of the administration's policies. And a positive is she is healthy as a consequence of eating nutritious food. Okay, so when you think consequence, just make sure that you're not um, turning it negative when that's not the intention. So karma is an extremely hidden phenomena. And to say extremely hidden phenomena might ring some bells for some of you, but just to clarify, this is a, as opposed to a manifest phenomena, something that's really clear and obvious to your mind, something you can directly observe. 
like the water in my glass that appears to my eye primary consciousness observing it in front of me. Karma is not a manifest phenomena. Karma is an extremely hidden phenomena as opposed to just a hidden phenomena. Okay, so the word extremely isn't there just for poetry, it's referring to something specific. So a hidden phenomena is like emptiness. So the emptiness of an inherently existent self that appears to the mental consciousness of an Arya Bodhisattva in single pointed equipoise on emptiness is the example of accessing a hidden phenomena. So to say hidden as opposed to extremely hidden, the difference mainly is that a hidden phenomena you can access through deep meditation. Uh, a hidden phenomena is something that you can, you can kind of penetrate the essence of while you're still a practitioner on the path. Whereas an extremely hidden phenomena is something only accessible by a fully enlightened mind. So if you were to frame it in, in terms that, I don't know, make more sense, think about, you know, one small thing like a cup. There are infinite causes and conditions for that cup, aren't there? If you go down to the atomic level and the whole history of the atoms that built the cup, do you know what I mean, right? So if you think about all of this spectrum of causes and conditions of one simple thing, our mind couldn't hold that much data. A computer couldn't hold that much data. You know, it couldn't know the whole history of matter and form related to this cup, um, the whole history of how cups came into being, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, all the causes and conditions of things are so infinite that it would take a completely enlightened mind to see all of that. Okay, which is why karma is only accessible by a Buddha, which means when we're trying to navigate karma, some things we do have to take as a word for it. Yeah, some things about karma, we just have to take the word for it of the Buddha and think he is a valid being because of all of these other things I can prove, because I have trust that a teacher of this type would not lie to me. And what's more, it's useful to think in this way because I live an ethical life that's not of harm to society. Therefore, we rely on our observations of the natural world and our reliance on the Buddha as being a valid being, and therefore his teachings on karma are non-deceptive. So our observations of the natural world can help reinforce this idea as well, like the example of the cup, or if you want to think of something more natural, like a seed of a flower. Yeah, the seed of a flower, the flower didn't come out of nowhere. It didn't just jump into the vase. Um, the, the flower had to come from a sprout and then the sprout grew into a bigger sprout and a bigger sprout and a bigger sprout. And all of that came from a seed, which was just a little potentiality. So we use the analogy of karmic seeds a lot because the idea of something that's just like bursting with potential, but it hasn't burst yet. Yeah, it hasn't sprung into a sprout yet, but it's just waiting there. And when it's watered, it comes to life as experience. So you just kind of sit with that. Is the Buddha a valid being? Is the Buddha a valid being? You know, I think that it's easy enough to think that he was an excellent scholar, an excellent meditator, someone who understood humanity very well. Um, if you practice the things that the Buddha taught, they work just as he explained them, but you have to do it and you have to repeat it again and again to be sure. And so in a way, determining that the Buddha is a valid being relates to your own conviction on your own ability to change. If you think that your mind can change when it meets with good tools, whether they're Dharma tools or other tools, that can give you a conviction that change is possible exponentially all the way to enlightenment and someone else probably has done it before us. <laughs> yeah, we've met people who are, quote, further along on the path than us, even if our pride doesn't want to admit it, even if our pride wants to tear them down and say, oh, I'd be like that too if I had this and this and this and this, or they're not so great, look at this and this and this and this. But if we're in a steady and happy and calm state of mind and we observe someone like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, we can see that this person 
has a more developed mind than we do, just based on how he lives and how he interacts and the way he can explain things, as well as his presence, et cetera, et cetera. Use any example you like. It could be your grandmother that reminds you of this potentiality. But if this potentiality exists, then you can think if someone like this is teaching me about cause and effect, why would they lie? Why would they lie? You know, if I personally, you know, think of yourself, if I personally had fully developed my compassion and fully developed my wisdom, what would I want for other people? What I would want for other people is for them not to suffer. What I would want for other people is for them to have stable, lasting happiness. And what I would do is to try and offer them the tools that worked for me to achieve that. So I wouldn't be deceptive or manipulative. I would just say, look, if you try this, it will lead to that. Some of it you can prove right away. Some of it will take some time. But if you try it, it will help relieve your pain. So in thinking about the Buddha being a valid being, you know, it's similar to like the trust you would have in a doctor. You haven't been to medical school, or maybe some of you have, but you haven't been to medical school to the point of knowing the essence of every single medicine or vitamin or remedy that you might be wanting to take if you're ill. But you have faith in the medical field, or you have faith in this person's education and experience. And that's enough to make you say, okay, even though I'm not sure all of the chemical components in this pill, I trust you that you're not going to poison me. I trust you that you want me to be healthy. And so I'm going to take it at the dosage that you prescribe. And when I have difficulty with side effects, I'm going to ask you and I'm going to ask the nurses how to navigate that. And that's why refuge is really important related to navigating the Buddha being a valid being. So, so just kind of sit with that of, there's lots of things that we have faith in that we wouldn't say is blind faith. And yet there is a part of it that we can't prove, but we can prove enough to make the last part of the leap. You know, many things about technology, many things about science, many things about medicine, we take it for granted that what experts of these fields tell us is true. We just take it for granted. We assume that what they're saying is true because we have faith in their education and their experience. We can prove some of those things based on our own education and our own reading and our own thinking, but we haven't walked through the whole process that they've walked through. So we really don't know exactly how what they're saying is true, but we believe that what they're saying is true. So having, quote, faith in the Buddha doesn't mean that you're submitting. It doesn't mean that you're asking him to save you. It doesn't mean that you're trying to get him to reward you and punish your enemies. It's nothing like that. It's like the faith you have in a doctor. So the Buddha, the doctor is saying karma exists and if we don't acknowledge the way in which karma exists, we're going to continue to suffer needlessly. We're going to continue to harm ourselves and others. So, so just kind of, all right, let's just sit with, maybe it's possible, maybe it's possible, because the Buddha is a valid being. Why not? So then how karma operates, some of this is review. There is the certainty of karma, which is that negative, harmful actions are the substantial cause of suffering, right? They're not necessarily talking about conditions yet, just the main thing, like the wood is the substantial cause for the table or the porcelain is the substantial cause for the cup. Negative, harmful actions are the substantial cause, the main thing that makes us suffer. And then there are also conditions. Positive, beneficial actions are the substantial cause of happiness, okay? So when we're happy, it's not about what's happening in front of us, that's a condition. When we're happy, it's because of the ripening result of past positive karma. Karma magnifies. This is very interesting. So from one seed, you get many branches. From one stone thrown in a lake, there are many ripples. The fact that karma magnifies, you know, this is true of both positive karma and negative karma. 
And I think that if you look at your own personal experience, you can sort of resonate with how that might be true. Yeah, you look at the natural world, but then you look at, especially when there's been a well thought out decision or choice in your life, one moment, but there was a lot of buildup and a lot of thought and you made a big choice, that choice then has a ripple effect with many, many results. So then the third point is that uh, we don't experience the effects of actions that you did not do. If you're experiencing a result, you created the cause. And if you create the cause, you are the one who will experience its result. Karma is individual. Yeah, of course, we're all conditions for one another, but the substantial cause is within your own continuum. Karma is not transferable. You can't take or give any one karma. When we do taking and giving meditation, Tong Len, what we're doing is becoming a very powerful condition for someone else's causes to ripen. We're not giving or taking any causes from them. We're being a powerful condition. But if they don't have the substantial cause, our taking of suffering or giving of happiness is not going to have an effect on them if they haven't created the cause. The last point is that the actions you have done do not perish. Sometimes this is framed as they don't go to waste or they don't finish. Um, an action will have a result eventually, unless there's been a countermeasure such as purification of the negative or anger, etc., for the positive. So the actions that you've done in the past, they just wait there like seeds on your mental continuum. Yeah, they just imagine your mental continuum with many, many seeds, positive, negative, neutral, countless seeds from beginningless time. They just wait. And then when they meet with the appropriate conditions for them to sprout, then they sprout as experience of happiness or suffering when they meet with conditions. So a lot of the work that we're trying to do both secularly and in the Dharma, is to prevent negative experiences arising and interrupt conditions that make old negative karma arise, which kind of like puts a lid on it. You know, it's like you're not watering any of the seeds, so you're not getting any of the plants, but the seeds are still there. And because we don't have strong mindfulness, because our concentration is not very precise and not very accurate in our daily life, when we're distracted, then we start watering the seeds again, the seeds for suffering. So, so generally, the techniques of psychology and the techniques um, of the sutra perspective of Buddhism in the method side are very good for preventing suffering from arising, but they don't interrupt the potential for suffering in future. Yeah. So what we want to do is for negative states of mind, and the karma that those negative states of mind create, we need to purify. But it's also important to remember that there's a type of like reverse purification, which is that positive seeds can be destroyed through things like anger and wrong views. Yeah, so the actions you have done do not perish. They don't go to waste. They will have a result eventually, unless, okay? So this one has fine print they will have an, a, res, a result unless you do something to purify. Okay, so just sitting with those four, getting really clear, there's the certainty of karma, the magnification of karma, not experiencing the effects of actions that you did not do, that actions you have done do not perish. So the sutra, um, reference for this particular teaching, the Buddha taught in the Rice Seedling Sutra, the Sutra of the Wise and Foolish, the Sutra on Karma. There are many sutras where the Buddha describes specifically how karma operates. And this particular presentation is coming from Lama Tsongkhapa's interpretation of that because his is the clearest, I think. So um, it's, a, it's an important thing to get your head around. This is how karma operates.
Okay, so then how do we create karma? There are three branches for a complete karma. Now to say a complete karma means like a significant one, right? A big one. There's all sorts of very minor karmas that we're doing all throughout the day that aren't particularly intentional. You know, like walking from here to your sink and getting a glass of water. You know, you have a plan, you set out to do it, you do it. It's, it's complete in a sense, but sometimes you do it a bit mindlessly. Or you go towards the sink, get distracted, go over there, look out the window. All of that does have an effect, but it's not a particularly um, obvious or significant effect. When we're looking at a significant effect, it comes from a complete karma. Complete karmas have the power to project a whole life, whole rebirth, as well as different experiences within that rebirth. So the three branches of the complete karma are the preparation, the action, and the completion of the action. You know, quite straightforward. Yeah, you, know, you plan on it, you do it, you finished it. But there's some specifics here that are important to understand. So the preparation is basically your motivation. Yeah, a big factor in whether your karma is positive or negative is obviously your motivation. So we have a wholesome or unwholesome intention to do something. There is a certain thing or person that is the object of our intention, and we identify that person or thing correctly. So um, that's important. The way you identify has to be you know, specific and accurate, or otherwise it's not totally accurate preparation. The second branch is that the action is done. And this is where it gets interesting because either we do it ourselves or we ask another person to do it. The karma is the same. So if you, um, I don't know, killed somebody and you, were, you murdered someone or you hired a hitman to kill someone, the karma for you is the same either way. Yeah, but if you hired someone to kill someone else, that someone else also has the killing karma. It might even be less than your killing karma because you were probably motivated by anger and attachment and all sorts of negative things in order to hire someone. The guy who was hired might just have some general attachment to money. And so, he, of course, he has an affliction present, killed someone, that's an incredibly heavy karma, but you, the one who paid him, might actually suffer more for it. So to say the action is done means either you do it or you got someone else to do it on your behalf. And then three is the act is completed. So you fulfilled the aim that motivated. And in addition, you rejoice in having done the action. So um, in the example of generosity, for example, you plan on, I don't know, giving food to the poor. You organize the supplies virtuously, ethically. You give food to the poor, and then you're happy about it, not in a self-satisfied way that's like, oh, I'm such a good person, but in a way that's like, ah, oh, that was an important thing to have done. I'm glad I did that. That was done. So this completion is an important component for making it complete. Yeah, the completion of it has been done. So we kind of make sure that that completion is, compl is very powerful when we do a dedication. You know, so you start out your meditation with your motivation, right? Then you sit and you do your meditation. And then afterwards you dedicate. It's really making sure that that meditation practice is a complete karma, which is very powerful for the future and happiness in the future. So dedication is a way of making sure you like stamp the complete karma and make sure that it's particularly powerful action that you've done. Okay, so just sitting with those three. To create karma, there needs to be these three steps in terms of a strong karma that has a long-term obvious lasting effect. Okay, so, you know, it seems like this is something that requires a lot of planning, but we do it all the time. You know, a mosquito lands on your arm, you see it, you want to kill it, you're angry at it for being there, you hit it, and you're happy that it died. That's a complete karma. You know, that has the power to project a negative rebirth and all sorts of negative experiences within that rebirth. 
you know, someone is homeless on the side of the road, you see them, you want to take care of them, you want to offer them support and aid. So you go over and you ask, are you okay? Can I give you something? Can I offer you something? Can I connect you with a social service? And they accept and you connect them with those social services and afterwards you finished it. Wonderful. Maybe it was just a five minute conversation on the side of the road, but that's a complete action that has a powerful positive effect. So while there is, you know, these three specific components, don't think that the time duration of creating it is that long. It's not necessarily. And so then there's the results of karma. First is the ripening result which is the body and the mind we will take in a future life. So the body and the mind that we have now is directly related to our past life. So if you're, um, you know, uh, healthy, if you're robust and strong, if your um, mind is easily stable, if your mind is easily disturbed, et cetera, et cetera, um, that is all a gift. <laughs> from your past life. Gift is the wrong word, but you know, that really has not a lot to do with you in this moment. So your body, of course, came from your parents. They were the condition, but they, you know, and they were the substantial cause of the flesh of your body and the genetics of your body. But the real substantial cause that made you go there to those parents, that was from a past life. No, you did not choose your parents. Okay. It takes um, a very developed mind to be able to specifically choose which parents you're going to. So the parents that we have in this life um, were probably quite similar in some aspects to them, um, or we have very strong karmic connection with them from having done a lot of activities together in the past. Positive activities or negative activities doesn't matter, but a very strong karmic magnetism is what makes you reborn in a specific family. So um, there's some similarity or else there's some time that was spent, a lot of time that was spent together with each other, maybe over many lifetimes or both. So the causally concordant result is the main part of this retreat is looking at the causally concordant result as well as the environmental result, which is coming next. The causally concordant result is the most psychological, I think. There's two types, right? There's the experiential, which is the experience of a situation similar to the one our actions caused others to experience, or the behavioral, which is um, the tendency to do that action again in the future. So the causally concordant results, basically what you give, you get, and what you do, you have a tendency to keep doing positive and negative. And then the environmental result is our experience of the environment and climate where we live, as well as that particular climate and environment. So the environmental results and the causally concordant results are where we do a lot of mind training as opposed to specifically purifying. Okay, so just, you know, sit with those three. These are the main results of karma. So environmental results, um, each non-virtue, for example, of course, all virtues have an environmental result as well but we're looking at the non-virtues because those are the ones we want to work on particularly. Um, so it gives an environmental result affecting the ambiance in which we live. The chart will help you see the results of the 10 non-virtues at a glance. The causally concordant behavioral result is not listed because it is the tendency to do that same action again. Like for killing, you have the tendency to kill. So that's not listed on the chart because it's obvious. Okay, so we're just going to look at the 10 non-virtues and what they give rise to. And as we go through each one, just try and think, is that my life right now? Did I create the cause for that? And also, am I still doing it? So the first one is killing. And 
causally concordant experiential result is a short life and or poor health. So when people experience poor health, um, the recommendation is to do a lot of purification related to killing, um, to do actions that are opposite of killing, like saving life, you know, rescuing an animal from the shelter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the environmental result is you live in a place with strife and war. Food and drink aren't healthy. Medicine is not potent. So it is interesting because, um, you know, I travel a lot and go to the grocery store and get the same basic groceries wherever I go. But some countries, the fruit and vegetables have like vitality, you know, they like bursting with life. You know, you eat an apple and you immediately feel zing, you know, full of health. And some countries, you know, you bite into an apple and you're like, hmm, wah, wah, bit papery, not much life. Huh. And it's interesting, you know, um, of course, it's my karma to experience that. But it's also kind of looking at the environment um, of the people there. So um, something interesting to, to sit with and um, ask, are we still killing or, um, I don't know, uh, electing people who are killing? So then stealing, um, the causally concordant experiential result is obviously poverty, being poor. Our things or our things are stolen or we don't have the power to use them. So there's some people that actually do have a lot of wealth, but they don't have the ability to kind of use them or take them out of the box or um, understand how they work. So they have the resources, but they can't access them or they don't have the resources at all or whenever they get something, it just gets stolen. No matter how safe or how careful they are, they're somehow always getting things stolen or things are always breaking. This is from stealing. So um, the environmental result is we live in a poor place with many dangers, droughts or floods, poor harvests and natural disasters. And then we have um, unwise or unkind sexual conduct. Um, sometimes this is just called sexual misconduct. And, um, you know, of course, like all religions, um, Buddhism has all sorts of lists about prohibited sexual behaviors. Um, and then in the modern era, we mostly just say that adultery, <laughs> right? So when, it, when you look at the you know, traditional lists in the Lam Rim Chenmo, most of the, the prohibitions about, you know, don't do sex this way or that way or this way or that way, they're related to hygiene or they're related to if you're harming someone else or if you're being rude to the people around you. So for example, on the list, it says, don't have sex during the daytime. And you think, okay but the reason is you know you have to read the commentary the reason is because during the daytime someone might walk in on you and be embarrassed and everyone's embarrassed and it's embarrassing and causes suffering so um so if you do ever come across one of those traditional lists in buddhism remember that like most religions it's related to either hygiene safety or whether or not it harms someone else the one that is seen as particularly harmful is adultery either cheating on your partner or um, stealing someone else's partner. The reason why is because it has the potential to break apart a family. And we know in Buddhism that, you know, kind mother sentient beings, mother, father sentient beings, you know, this is kind of where we have the most security and love, especially in our early childhood. This is the place where we were offered the most kindness and the most resources. Theoretically, right? Of course, that's not the case for everyone. But theoretically, the family system is something that gives a lot of security and safety for everyone. And to be a condition that breaks apart a family is a huge harm. So um, it's different than recognizing that things aren't working out and you need to have a divorce and everyone is kind and civil about it. The most beautiful divorce I ever saw, they had like an um, uncoupling ceremony and um, both sides of the family came back together as if it was the wedding. And they said, you know, thank you for this and thank you for that. And here's my new stepchildren. And here's my new stepchildren. And it was like this beautiful thing of thank you for these 20 years and now it's time to go. So divorce isn't the problem. It's sexual misconduct is the problem because of the deception and the betrayal and um, the way in which it can lead to so many other 
negativities. You know, it's not like you're just doing the cheating. You're also all of the lying and all of the deception around the activity. So um, when we look at then the causally concordant experiential result, what happens is then you wind up with disagreeable or unfaithful spouses in the future. That means your marriages just don't work out. You have marital disharmony even if you stay together. So in the future, when you're married, it's gonna be uncomfortable. And um, you know, that's something that's really rough for folks. So you know, the environmental result is life in a dirty place with poor sanitation, a foul odor, and misery. And um, there's always jokes at Lama Zopa Rinpoche's retreats in Australia because there's like, you know, 400, 500 of us and there's all the like porta potties and they get filled up really quickly. And then there's this horrible smell in one part of the retreat. And then we all walk around going, oh, it's our sexual misconduct karma from the past. Oh, you know, so when there's a terrible smell, we look at each other and go, sorry, sorry, <laughs> you know. And this is the way to think about negative experiences of, oh, wow, I created this. I better make sure I'm not still creating this. Then uh, lying, um, others slander and deceive us. Slander meaning they, um, you know, t tell falsehoods about our character, you know, and they really seek to tear us down. Um, people don't believe us or trust us, even when we're telling the truth. They'll accuse us of lying even when we're telling the truth. So from lying, even if you don't lie now, even if you stopped lying or it doesn't happen very often, if people don't trust you, even though you're trustworthy, you can get so frustrated and think, what's wrong with people? What's wrong with life? What's wrong with me? If you think about karma, then you just sit with, oh, well, that was me at some point, and now I'm just reaping the result. You know, now here's my harvest that I gave myself. You know, if I respond to that well, then I finish that negative karma. If I don't respond to it well, I create other negative karmas and more suffering in the future. So uh, the environmental result is like disharmony in the workplace, uh, deceitful people, corruption in society, and you feel afraid. Often you feel afraid and you're not sure why, just kind of a rumbling anxiety. So I think a lot of places and a lot of cultures there's a lot of anxiety and there's obvious conditions and societal reasons for that. But there's also, you know, lots of people um, have anxiety that they're trying to point to and they can only say, oh, maybe it's chemical. But really, you know, it's coming from the environmental result of having lied in the, in the past. Um, divisive speech, I think, is more common for adults than lying. Um, maybe you tell little white lies, little small lies, but divisive speech is actually fairly common, even for very nice people. So it's something that I think we all need to really be careful about um, when we're processing or debriefing or, you know, venting about a difficult day, that we don't let it shift into divisiveness. So. You know, divisiveness basically means that you're speaking in a way that could separate other people. So if you're talking to someone about a third party and you know that they can hear negative things without turning against that third party, then maybe you're processing and you're just working out solutions and you're trying to, you know, move through it. But sometimes we speak about someone else's faults because we want to look good or we want sympathy or whatever, whatever. And it serves no purpose, you know, it serves no positive purpose. We just do it because we're used to it. Um, and because sometimes there's a justification for it. And then that opens the door and we do it all the time. A lot of how we speak about politics and politicians is, is divisive and it's, it's understandable, but it actually doesn't fulfill what we want it to fulfill. We're not coming up with solutions. We're just feeding our anger. And so what happens with divisive speech is that you have a lack of friends. Uh, people don't like to be with us. We're separated from spiritual masters and Dharma friends, or we don't meet them to begin with. And we have a bad reputation. The environmental result is a rocky, uneven land with cliffs, a place where travel is difficult and dangerous. Yep, so we just think, Am I experiencing any of those results? Then I must have created the cause. 
um, am I still creating that cause? And then harsh speech, um, this is when you intentionally are using your words as weapons. We're insulted, blamed, criticized, even when we speak with a good, under, good intention, others misunderstand us. So that's what happens from, from harsh speech. Um, we live in a barren, dry place that is inhabited by uncooperative people and has thorns, sharp stones, scorpions, and dangerous animals. So, you know, harsh speech isn't just being kind of casual um, or, you know, being a bit, I don't know, colloquial. Harsh speech is when you're intending to wound with your words. And then idle talk or senseless speech, um, what comes from that is people don't listen to our words or value what we say or they laugh at us. It means that in the future, even if we have something very important to say, people don't care. And I think a lot of us experience that where we finally, you know, want to say something important and no one is listening and no one cares. And of course, um, we still do a lot of idle talk and a lot of gossip and just unnecessary filling in the space. And so the environmental result is a drab place, like boring, um, with unbalanced climate, where fruit does not ripen at the proper time. Wills go dry, flowers and trees don't blossom, or they don't blossom at the right time. Unpredictable. Um, covetousness, this related to attachment. We have intense desires and cravings, can't complete projects or fulfill our wishes and hopes, our ventures fail. So if we're really coveting others or coveting the possessions of others or coveting the circumstances of others, what that leads to is a mind that is really used to being unsatisfied and a mind that is always hunting and craving for things. And you might have all sorts of good projects you want to work on, but you're just really distracted and you can't settle because you've got so much craving and obsession in your mind. Environmentally, there's small crops. Um, our property belongings in the environment constantly deteriorate and um, it's an isolated or a poor place or country. Malice is related to anger. And um, if we cultivate that, then we experience great hatred, fear, suspicion, guilt, paranoia, and fright for no obvious reason. So sometimes you just don't like someone for no reason whatsoever. You just have an immediate eruption. You know, there was a lot of malice in your past. Environmentally, you live in a place with epidemics, disputes, dangerous animals and poisonous snakes, wars and calamities, unpleasant food. So, you know, right now we're experiencing a pandemic, but each individual country is experiencing it to a different degree. Each different community is experiencing it to a different degree. And then each individual person is experiencing it at an individual level. So there's kind of this like, in, you know, communal karma or shared karma, where we all have to experience a world that has a pandemic. And this is coming from malice, um, which is why there's a lot of emphasis on meditating on loving kindness right now to counter that. Um, but there's also your specific experience of that as well. And then finally, um, wrong views. We're very ignorant and dull mentally, have difficulty understanding the Dharma and take a long time to gain realizations. So wrong views include uh, a faulty belief system, a belief system that you really adhere to and have conviction in that is absolute nonsense and actually damaging. You know, like thinking that animal sacrifice will lead to liberation or that, you know, washing in certain bodies of water is purifying you of all your negative karma or maybe an excessive belief in certain types of astrology or things like that. But it also can be, you know, maybe excessive adherence with rigidity and fundamentalism to any number of things, types of science, types of psychology, et cetera, et cetera. So wrong views isn't just wondering or questioning or thinking maybe, it's actually having a strong belief that is incorrect. And this leads to these results. So then few crops, lack of home and protector, natural resources exhausted, springs go dry, polluted environment, chaotic society. Okay, so this isn't to bring us down, actually. This is to make us go, oh, that's why that happens. Oh, okay, so if I don't like that, then there's a way to change. 
So we prevent or minimize negative karma from ripening as suffering through purification, um, either through vajrasattva practice with the four opponent powers, or through the wisdom realizing emptiness of inherent existence, or both, okay, or both. And um, so we'll just kind of go through quickly because um, I know Venerable Children did the four opponent powers with you guys before, um, and we'll do it as our meditation tonight. So those are your four opponent powers, refuge, regret, remedy, resolve. So connecting with healthy knowledge and observation of what the afflictions can create, connecting with ideals of compassion and the visualized embodiment of that. Regret is the most important part, remembering your own negative, destructive actions of body, speech, and mind, seeing a fault to be a fault, with sincere acknowledgement that those behaviors, while dependently arisen and empty, are still conventionally wrong and to be prevented. The remedy is the countermeasure to the negativity, an opposite action or one of healing and transformation. So you can do Vajrasattva mantra and visualization, or meditating on loving kindness and compassion, or do the opposite of the mistake, like for killing, saving lives. Resolve is a time-specific and reasonable promise about a change you'll make. What can be different, even for a few seconds? So you make a plan, you make a promise, you know, even if it's just until the end of the day, I won't criticize my mother. <laughs> yeah. And then um, you finish by dedicating that you are purified and uh, let go of identification. And so um, you either have Vajrasat practice or you do the wisdom realizing emptiness, just remembering the emptiness of the three spheres, the agent, the action, the object. Yeah. But um, more importantly right now, you know, we can do different things on purification, but right now what we're looking at is how we can change the way we look at negative karma ripening. So there's a million reasons why karma is created and how is it experienced and etc cetera, etc cetera. and i've just given you an overview and that's enough for now okay so i know that you guys are going to be intrigued and tantalized and want to ask what about this what about this for now let's just leave that and think about okay what's in front of me what's in front of me that i don't want or what's come up a lot in my past and how can I change the way I look at negative karma ripening? Okay, so we purify to prevent negative karma from ripening. But once it's ripened, what do we do? Yeah, once it's too late, once the flower has blossomed, right? What do we do? And we do lojong or thought transformation, mind training practices. So a lot of these you've looked at, um, precious garland, bodhisattva's way of life, you haven't done as much but you've looked at eight verses of thought transformation and um, cohort one's looked at 37 practices of a bodhisattva and you guys have looked at seven point mind training. But now we're gonna look at Dharma Rakshita's wheel of sharp weapons because it's very much about causally concordant effects and environmental effects. And instead of going into you know, huge long purification practices, it's purifying in a different way, which is like a radical reframing, okay? So Wheel of Sharp Weapons is radical reframing. Yeah, so um, the radical reframing in this text um, today, the verses to look at today, and you don't have to look at all of them, you'll get an idea quite quickly, but the verses to look at today are verses 10 through 45. Verses 10 through 45 are the, when this happens, here's why. When this happens, here's why. And again and again, it's like, when this happens, here's why, then what to do, or how to think about it, so that it doesn't keep happening. So there's this whole concept of the wheel of sharp weapons returning, basically meaning that what you put out, now you're experiencing. Acknowledge and own that. It's empowering. It helps you change. It's empowering, it helps you change. So um, during your personal practice, um, 
that's what to sit with the when verses verses 10 through 45 just kind of read through them and make a mental note of the ones you can really see are applying to you and um, and really sit with those okay so that's what we'll do during the personal practice but